It is now 12.30 Jewish time. Okay, this is session one of Changing Wisdoms with Reform Judaism. And today we're going to begin and explore uh, interpreting using two different ways of thinking. One is praxomics and the other are the rabbinical rubrics. So where we're going to go today, well, we're going to begin talking about why changing wisdoms, and then we're going to explore the changing wisdoms, and we're going to do that through the two lenses. One's the praxomics lens, and the other is the reform rabbinics lens. And then we're going to conclude with a couple of slides uh, that uh, anticipate what we're going to do in the next two sessions, and also talk about this pot potential facilitation project. I, I'll say a little bit ahead of time, and then I'll say it again later. Uh, as I was creating this slideshow, um, I was reading on the uh, various projects that uh, have been done to try to reduce bias and uh, among police departments and medical uh, uh, facilities and so forth. And they haven't been successful. And the reason why they haven't been successful is because of one shot uh, efforts. So they have a, a, a big presentation like this, and they think that that's going to change somebody's biases. No, it doesn't work. You, you have to practice in between time. One of my students did a study um, years ago in which she found that if you have a snippet uh, of news and you rehearse it the next day, you will remember it a month later. If you wait a week and rehearse it, you might as well have forgotten it, okay? But she only tried one rehearsal. I think if, re if you rehearse every week, you're gonna keep it. So the idea of that facilitation project is to give people an opportunity to rehearse the ideas that we're gonna talk about today. So now, why changing wisdoms? They came up with four ideas about it. And uh, um, I'm gonna, I have a slide on each one of these ideas. So why don't you, just skim over them uh, pretty quick. Uh, and then we'll talk about them. Okay. What does praxomics have to do with understanding history and personal experience? Well, uh, like I was mentioning to, to Steve, uh, he, he got on early to help me uh, get ready for this kindly. Uh, and we were uh, talking about how I got started with this project 55 years ago. And that was uh, uh, Chomsky's criticism of B.F. Skinner's verbal learning and verbal behavior in which Chomsky told him, uh, there's no unit of analysis for, for behavior. And so I made that. Uh, I, I agreed with him and I made it my life work to make one. So once history had cells and elements and molecules and so forth, the environment and our bodies became much less mysterious than they were before. We could actually talk about them. Maybe we don't all have a course in biology, but we understand that there are cells, we understand that there are genes, we understand their organs and species and so forth. Those are part of our vernacular language. We don't have any good language for talking about human practices. And so today we're going to uh, <clears throat> talk about a unit that does that. Um, so without having a unit of, of human practices, we make all kinds of silly mistakes about history and personal experience. And the next slide will tell you something about that. So the unit that um, um, I've been studying is called a mode of practice, and we'll learn a lot more about that. And, um, and the more I explore it, um, the more I learn that there's a whole lot to learn about it. Uh, and also, the scale is really interesting. We have done studies that show that the mode of practice is a unit that works just as well for history as it does for individual development. And then I have casual observations uh, that tell me that it works quite well for conversations. So the scale all the way from conversations to lives to historical events is also an interesting issue. Uh, 
Um, okay, here, I told you there were some silly ideas. Here's silly ideas, stages of development, eras of history and generations. Everybody in Gen Z is alike and they're all different from everybody in Gen X. Come on, what a very silly idea. It's kind of like saying that everybody, uh, all the different uh, apes are alike and they're all different from all the different humans and all the different humans are alike. Uh, there's no difference between them. Rather difficult idea. <laughs> um, maybe eras and generations and stages might be useful in a sense like uh, species are useful, but species aren't useful until you have a whole linear classification to put them into. Also, another silly idea is rating points. Um, okay, uh, is a four the same for you as it is for me? Oh, uh, what about a three? Is that the same for you as me? How about everybody has a, the, where the three has the same kind of experience, but in everybody's three experience is different from everybody else's four experience. That's a pretty silly idea. I had one out of my 300 interviews I just couldn't finish because every time I tried to get him to discriminate between different levels of experience with, his, with respect to his expertise, he, he thought it was due to talent. I don't know what he thought the parents did and the teachers did, but, but everything was, was due to talent. Mozart had a lot of talent, right? And then you remember in the book, uh, in the music, uh, the video, excuse me, the, the uh, I don't know how many people actually saw the movie about Amadeus uh, in which uh, Mozart was practicing, 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 and the longer he practiced, the better he got at it. But, but of course, practice doesn't really do anything, but practice makes perfect. Well, one thing any musician can tell you, and I'm sure Brian will agree with this, if you practice mistakes, you'll get better at them. You'll get really good at making mistakes, right, Brian? That's right. You have to <laughs> practice correctly. Yes, right. Perfect so practice... practice makes perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, even that, we're going to see that there's two different kinds of learning. And really, to get perfect, you got to have both kinds. And we'll come to that later. Okay. So now, praxomics also tames complexity without simplifying it. Okay. Eras and and... Uh, generations simplify complexity way too much. But um, a, a easy way to get a, a, a handle on the complexity is to make an analogy with a deck of cards. Think about it. You have 13 numbers, right? From ace through king. And then you have four suits. And how many different poker hands can you make? Or how many different hands you can make all together? There's two billion, two and a half billion, okay? Uh, so in a field of experience, you can have 13 dimensions and four modes of practice. And that can create two and a half billion wisdoms. All right, so I haven't defined what those terms are, but just remember that they're there. You can get rich evidence from interviews. I, I interviewed 300 people altogether, uh, 60 of them from Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion. And uh, that, those 60 included all the rabbinical faculty of the college between nine, uh, 2009 and 2013. Uh, and we put the, the interviews together into one, uh, what I call a, a praxo system, a, a table of the uh, modes of practice used in different dimensions in rabbinical development. Uh, and I actually took the individual interviews, they, those were all recorded uh, and notes were taken and I sent the notes to the faculty members and they corrected them my notes and sent them back. Then I took all the notes from all the, uh, all the faculty members and put them together into one system and sent those out for, for critique. And the result was that they had 12 dimensions with four modes of practice each. And they used those to assess their student development for their 2013 accreditation. 
uh, which passed uh, with the middle states. Um, recently, uh, Michael Stevens uh, and I are working uh, on a book. Uh, we're going to be expanding the um, previews into discussions about both uh, the rabbinical rubrics and the praxomics uh, as a way to uh, help people think about synagogue more. And we've added a, a, a dimension of gender and sexuality, which wasn't in the original rubrics. Um, and um, uh, the reason why is they generally use uh, gender and sexuality attitudes for admissions. If somebody is too biased, um, they're kind of discouraged from uh, coming to Hebrew Union. Okay, so the result is a microscope for our tradition. Okay, so the microscope helps us find cells. This is a microscope for hel helping us find the basic units of, of uh, practice. And it is, the microscope is a table of wisdoms. Of course, what that means will be explained shortly. Uh, and uh, they've been, there's been a snippet of the wisdoms that have been used for our Torah portion previews. Did, was there a, a, a comment from somebody? Okay, guess that maybe, maybe we're picking up some, somebody that's not even among us. <laughs> I just heard a little background. Okay, knowing uh, the last slide about why, uh, is knowing how wisdoms change is fun and it's functional and it's fascinating. Okay, so it's fun because you can actually have a short interaction with somebody and you can identify their commitment in the same way that uh, I'm sure that, uh, that Brian can hear somebody play the, uh, the violin and quickly identify their commitment. Actually, music is, is one of the ways that uh, people have most uh, experience paying attention to how much practice somebody has. But if you go through a supermarket, uh, you can tell how much practice somebody has had uh, it, just by watching them check, uh, check you out. So you know uh, what they've learned and how accurate and fast they're doing it. So it's it's a fun thing just to, every time that I paid attention to somebody else um, and noted, boy, you're really good at that. Um, I get a big smile, okay? That's a good way to connect with other people. And that's what makes knowing about uh, modes of practice useful or, or fun. It's also a uh, functional. Sometimes you get really surprising reactions from people, and and we'll we'll talk especially about uh, the exploring mode of practice. Uh, it can create surprises in your interactions, but it gives you a way to understand those surprises and even uh, to come up with some ideas about uh, things to do. It also helps you to 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 get an easy um, comfort with all the different kinds of opportunities that you have when you're interacting with people. And then the third thing, it's fascinating for me because I you know, always love literature and science and uh, gives me ways to, to reinterpret. And so I have great fun writing tour portion previews every year, every week, <laughs> because there's so many different things that I do. So here's the words that I used, haven't defined any of them. Now, if I ask you to use those words to uh, interpret um, via uh, a couple excerpts from via hell, anybody want to try?
Okay. I kind of suspected that. So the next slide. Whoops. I better use my down arrows. It's mouse is gonna. So what just happened? When I ask you to use a bunch of words that uh, I hadn't defined yet, it was probably not a very nice ask, but probably one you've had before, especially since we're an educated group of people. <laughs> it's something that teachers do to people a lot. Um, so what do we need? Well, we need definitions of these terms. We need a little opportunities to practice with them, right? Any other ideas of things we might need? Um, an, uh, an example, you know, maybe sure. maybe you going first. <laughs> no, no. Oh, yes. Okay. Ah, okay. A model. Yeah. Nice idea, Melissa. Thank you. Any other ideas? Well, probably a, a, a very basic um, example that um, we can relate to most of us in our everyday life. So that if you put it in terms that we can all relate to, it makes more sense. And you go, oh, okay, you can make the analogy. And that sounded like Pat, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Pat. <laughs> I can't see everybody. I just can see uh, four people here on this little, little side thing. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's a, an everyday life example. That's that's good. Um, so now, if we have those examples, is that going to be enough? I have another suggestion. You could have us um, talk amongst ourselves, or you know, our other partner up with somebody and discuss it first, and kind of see what someone else on our level is thinking before we approach the teacher and give them an answer. <laughs> cool idea! Excellent idea. Are you, were you a teacher, Pat? Yes, I was. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Always a teacher. <laughs> yeah, nice idea. Okay. Uh, and so here, here what, what we're doing here is we're planning and then uh, Pat just suggested we have some kind of rehearsal, okay? And uh, there was a, a suggestion that I could help by giving, uh, giving examples. So, okay, great ideas. Let's move on and do some of them. So now, we're going to actually explore these concepts. I, I just inter I introduced why, and I gave some, I hope, dilemmas about, you know, oh man, ears isn't useful. Gen Z isn't it useful. These are, uh, it's not useful to just rate people. Okay, hopefully those are, are enough of, of a dilemma to motivate you to think about it might be fun to learn to explore these ideas a little bit more. And um, I want you to start with something that's very visual uh, and something that anybody that doesn't have grandchildren here, you don't have grandchildren, Denise? No, not, not yet. Me neither. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, well, you've probably seen some kids' drawings, though, anyway, right? Oh, absolutely. All right. So our first big success with finding a unit of analysis for human practices was with drawing. So if you have a pencil and paper, I would like you to make a drawing. Now, Judy's drawing. I don't see Michael drawing over there. Are you Mike? Are you drawing Michael? 
<laughs> I'm not a draw artist. I'm just trying to draw something. <laughs> <laughs> I have a delightful painting made by Judy's in my dining room. <laughs> she, she, I, we took them up to the Amish country, and she made me take a photograph, and then she used that photograph to to make a make a painting of our Amish country trip, which was just delightful. That's nice. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, so I'm not sure what kind of drawing you ended up making, but and these are just categories. They're they're not uh, modes of practice because there's multiple modes of practice for each one of the categories, and I'll get to some of those in in a minute, but. People start out with scribbles, okay? And then uh, after they get into school, usually they start making geometric drawings. So, you know, the triangle uh, on top of a square, and then you make a little uh, angle, uh, rectangle on it, and you put smoke coming out of the chimney, and, and that's a house, and it's all on a baseline. Those are geometric drawings. And then there's the Grandma Moses style. Height represents distance. You have front and sides of houses. So you got three dimensional objects. You got controlled curves and the outlines of objects and stuff. And then finally, maybe way at the end of high school, you might have a few kids that are doing uh, symbolic drawings and functional drawings and so forth. And so, so those are motivating drawings. They, they actually, um, artists know how to control your eye movements with their uh with their drawings okay so here are three different dimensions now we have dimensions and uh we define these dimensions ahead of time we coded over 1200 drawings made by kids at age four to 19 and um the uh this the solid lines represent the actual frequency of each kind of drawing so if you think Okay, there's no shape control, so things are just scribbled, okay? And that starts out at age five, almost 90% of the kids are doing no shape control. You see that? Does that make sense in that first graph there? Uh, and a very few, will have, maybe the 10% will have some line control, which means that they're making these geometric shapes. So the... the they can make a square that actually is within 90% of the size of the square uh, kind of thing. And, and then um, it, it, almost no kids at five, uh, age five will use controlled curves in the outlines of objects. For example, on the back of a horse, it looks like the S-shaped curve is embedded in the outline of the horse, for, for example. Um, so shape control is one dimension. Another dimension is whether they put it on, things are floating up in the air for the scribbles, okay? Then they make a baseline and everything is on the baseline. And then they do the Grandma Moses kind of thing where height represents distance and that's the dimensionality. And then for, for viewer distance, um, we have figure ground, uh, which is even more like 95% of the kids start with just figure ground they don't use overlap. Overlap only appears where part of an object is cut out. So, so if you have somebody standing in front of the house, part of the house is cut out so that you don't see it. So the, the, the overlap is actually represented in, in, in the drawing. And then really advanced drawings will, will have uh, texture gradients and size gradients to represent where size represents distance. If you're if you're seeing Steve there uh, with his uh, industrial tower behind his head, Steve's head is bigger than the industrial tower. Well, that that is a gradient. So the the uh, the distant objects are are, are somewhat smaller. So that's a, that's a much more advanced kind of thing, and it takes a long time to take off. Look at that. Even fifteen year olds generally don't do it. Another thing about each one of these things is look at the dotted line. The dotted lines were made by an Excel formula. Hmm. 
took me a, uh, a very long time to find that formula. <laughs> I'm a decent mathematician, but I'm not a really good one. But I, I hooked up with the people from the Chaos Society who are really good mathematicians. And one of them pointed me to, uh, to predator prey equations. And I generalized those into uh, the equations that actually fit these drawings. Drawing day. So there's, I call them uh, either characteristics or, or of each one of the curves or parameters. If you look back here, 100, the social prevalence is where they start. Okay. So we have 95% of five year olds or 90% of five year olds make haphazard drawings. So that's where they start. It's very prevalent to make scribbles at the beginning. Then you have the growth, okay? The growth is represented, okay, the first uh, one of these curves, haphazard, no, uh, no uh, dimensionality and figure ground, they don't grow. They just decline in usage, okay? So growth is zero for them. The reason why they're declining is one of the other parameters, and I'll get to that in a second. Some of these things grow really fast, though. Look at the baseline. It really shoots up there from five to seven, to, from about 50% all the way up to, to uh, about 85%. So growth, the, uh, for the beginning strategy, there's none. It's very rapid generally for the exploring strategy, and it's moderate for the more advanced ones. Now, the reason why we're having competitive strength is when we defined these, we made it impossible for, for them to have two different strategies in the same drawing. What, and the way we did that was we said, okay, we want the most advanced strategy that you can prove in the drawing. And that's, that is what you're, you're gonna code it for. So the most advanced strategy that you uh, include in the drawing actually drives out the more primitive ones. So may maybe you might use it in just a corner of the drawing, like in a Matisse, for example. Uh, there's a beautiful drawing of chess players in the living room. And the only thing that's really advanced is at the motivational level uh, of that drawing, other than just the elaborate elaborateness of the decorations. The only really advanced thing was a, a piece of sculpture on the mantle in the living room. Everything else was a grandma Moses type uh, of um, shape control, dimensionality, and viewer distance. Um, so there is a competitive strength, and the, the later strategies are driving out the earlier strategies. And that's this. And finally, we have this thing called uh, depletion, which is. Uh, What happens when you start making more drawings uh, than it, the social circumstances really uh, accept? So if if you're still making stick men on baselines and all your drawings are are that way and you're in a fifth grade group, maybe you'll get a response like, "Yeah, hey, you're drawing a baby. Let me do that." <laughs> Is that did that sound right, Pat? <laughs> Maybe they'll be nicer than that. They won't let the teacher hear them. But uh, for drawing, we really don't have um, evil activities. But if you think of teenagers as being the master explorers, things grow really, really qu quickly. And things like driving too fast, uh, taking drugs, uh, promiscuous sexuality, and so forth, um, those are considered to be uh, evils. And if you're looking at, at history, certainly uh, a, Holocaust is not a sustainable activity as far as history is concerned, but it's been going on for a, a long time in a lot of different uh, cultures. It is a primitive way to respond to the stresses uh, of a culture, but it's considered evil. Uh, then um, Generally, the um, sustaining practices are the kind of things you see on a job when somebody's doing. And if you're still doing the same job and 
you've been doing it for 10 years, rolling cigars from Cuba, <laughs> then uh, you're probably bored with it, okay? You can't wait for the weekend or retirement, whichever comes first. On the other hand, if you get to the inspiring level where you're creating innovations and discoveries, then you never, you never reach a depletion level. Okay, so uh, can you code your drawings? The ones you just made? Anybody have any questions about coding their drawings? Can you decide what shape control you used and what viewer distance you used and what dimension you used? Nobody had difficulty with that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at my drawing, and uh -huh. um, so I, I, I think there. Well, there there are different levels for each of these. Um, so in shape control, I mean, <clears throat> I am far from an artist. <laughs> it's um, okay, but That's it's why I picked more, it. It's certainly more than haphazard. Uh huh. Um, I tried to use, you know, lines. So there's some geometric concept here. Uh -huh. um, there, there are curves involved, um, and I do try to have proportions. So I mean, maybe. All right. So. Okay. Now, where the curves motivating seem to be, you know, very, very out there, and, um, very grandiose. And so let, let me let me ask you: Did you have S-shaped curves? So did the curves change directions? Well, I tried to create water. So I have, you know, like that. Oh, can you show us? I don't know. Well, not with my... <laughs> Your yeah. background is covering it up. <laughs> <laughs> is that? No? Oh, there. There you go. Let's see. No, I don't know if you can see it. Right there. Oh. That's it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. No, no, lost no. it again. You know what? I can uh, You'd have to share your screen for us to see it, I think. Um, let me video. Go back and I, I don't know if you if you could if your sharing your screen would compete with oh there we go. So that's your lighthouse, huh? Right. All right. Well, I can tell you, um, it does look like your water there has some S-shaped curved in it. Um, in terms, uh, okay, so you do have some gradients there too, because the object way in the far back is supposed to be a steamship. Is that the case? Right. My my rendition yeah. of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, so you you also have some some uh, a gradient in there. Um, it does kind of look like you have a base plane too, because it's uh, given that you only had a little time with it. But it it does look like a base plane. So I I think you're pretty much in the in the Grandma Moses type of of uh, drawings for that. So that's the first time anybody, you know, related me to Grandma Moses. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think that it, it really wasn't a true perspective. And um, I don't know if you were intentionally uh, were uh, controlling our eye movements. They did, they, there's, the tower did come out first and then you move towards uh, a, a little distance there. Um, so uh, I don't think there was true proportions and there wasn't any shaded edges. So you're definitely in the Grandma Moses category for those, for most of the dimensions, I think. And that's inspiration for me. That's Yeah, there you go. So maybe you should take up painting. <laughs> 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 okay, so those are modes of practice. Remember, we've got these four modes of practice. Beginning, exploring, sustaining, and inspiring. 
Those are our four modes of practice. Some people will try to turn them into five. Um, we haven't found good evidence for five modes of practice. We found good evidence for, for four. Um, and in fact, Brian, it, it's the musicians that want five, five levels. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I think that they're really just, uh, they're not pulling, they're just looking at um, the speed and accuracy, the iterative learning to make some of those distinctions. The second type of learning that I promised I was going to tell you about is transformative learning. And there's an interesting story here. And that is, um, when I did the interviews at Hebrew Union, I knew these four modes of practice. We had found these four modes of practice in drawings and kids' writings. And, and I had interviewed uh, 80 faculty members at Savannah College of Art and Design and another 25 friends in, in various different fields. So but by the time I got to Hebrew Union, I had 100 interviews under my belt, uh, getting people to tell me the dimensions of the. Uh, the four modes of practice in the dimensions of development of their expertise, okay? But I couldn't tell them why people were changing from one mode to the next. And um, so I was giving the keynote speech at the New England uh, Educational Assessment uh, uh, Alliance uh, in uh, I, Mount Holyoke College in, in Western Massachusetts. And uh, the board of the uh, association uh, took me out for dinner the night before. And I was telling them about this, this problem that um, here I have these different modes of practice, but I don't have a good understanding for how you get, why you get from one mode to the other. And uh, this one guy said, well, you ever heard Jack Mesro? And I said, no. He said, well, he spent his career at Columbia in, in adult education, and he wrote a book called Transformative Learning. Well, Jack Mesereau had 10 different steps of transformative learning. He got interested in it because his wife changed careers. And so he watched all the transformations in, in her approach to her new career after she changed it from her old one. Uh, and he had these 10 different steps. Well, uh, I, in the college that I was working at af after Hebrew Union, <clears throat> was a, a small liberal arts college, about 1,500 students, <clears throat> a nice place. <clears throat> and uh, they had four people in the counseling department. And the head of the counseling department, when I showed him the, the uh, transformative learning steps. He says, man, that's exactly what we do. That's what we're trying to accomplish all the time when we're working with our students. And I said, well, why don't I make a form and you can uh, evaluate each student at the end of each counseling session and we'll see how they develop. And of course, this was, again, for accreditation, we have to be, be able to assess what we're doing and show that we're actually making some progress. He loved the idea. And so they coded the next 500 sessions that they had. And we found that the timing uh, of the 10 different steps was it actually occurred at four different times. And so the first thing is you have some kind of dilemma. I was talking to you about having tried to create a dilemma and uh, introducing the idea that ratings, uh, rating points, and Gen Z and so forth were uh, too primitive to be very useful ideas. So the first thing is a dilemma. Uh, and that uh, you have to actually pay attention to it. You have to detect that you're having a dilemma before it has any impact. The next step is you start to examine it. And then uh, Melissa and Pat were made these wonderful contributions back there to we need to examine the terms uh, and uh, ideas about getting aside and discussing them, um, sharing with others, sharing with your friends, assessing your role in the dilemma, 
Um, why do we just let them get away with Gen Z and Gen X rather than discriminating people? You know, um, so we all have a role in the um, the. Why did we let? Uh, even though Chomsky told us Skinner was wrong, that was way back in the mid '50s. For heaven's sakes, psychology still doesn't have a decent unit of practice. They still make up their units and then study the things that they make up. And of course, they're having a whole bunch of problems with replicating studies and all kinds of stuff. That I read Science Magazine every every week, and there's and also perspectives in psychological science. There there was a a whole issue uh, of that uh, journal um, devoted to the problems that psychology is having, really because they don't have a decent unit of analysis. It's really reliable. When we coded those children's drawings, we had three independent raters and they agreed over 90% of the time and every rating that they had. So, <clears throat> um, and they could do it for 1200 different examples. They're, they're not just, making up things and then having them on a pencil and paper so they can uh, record them. They were actually making observations like you would if you were a naturalist going out in the environment. You, you'll be able to identify the species that you're looking at. You might make a few mistakes, but most of the time you're going to have, a, uh, if you are a, a trained naturalist, you're, you're going to have to be pretty good at identifying the species that you see. Okay, so uh, the second step is examining the problem. And then you end that step when you say, okay, what do I need to do? Well, um, you need to plan, you need to rehearse, and uh, you, often it's useful to have somebody else help you. So again, uh, I keep thinking about Brian because the musicians actually my best use of modes of practice was by a group of musicians they uh they had an after school program in Newport News uh for uh in a school 100% of the kids were free lunch kids uh, and uh, it was an after school music program and I did their evaluation for Oh, let's see. I guess I'm on year nine now. <laughs> anyway, for year after year after year. And they really made incredibly good use of it. And one of the things they found out is when they stop grading on the curve and start really identifying the practices that people are using, the kids that are in the bottom of the curve, the ones who got kind of a late start, and who would have always been on the bottom of the curve and probably would have quit, stay in the program because every year they they advance. So no more A, B, C, D, E. It is what modes of practice are you using and have you really transformed up to this next mode of practice? And they, they had nine dimensions and they, they could show the parents that the kids were improving and then they stayed in the program. Even though they were still at the bottom of the class, they were still getting to be better musicians and stuck with it. You know, we, and then, oh, excuse sorry. Me. we gave, when I first started teaching, uh, you know, band and orchestra, the report card had a letter grade and then uh, criteria that we checked off evident, kind, consistently evident, et cetera. And, you know, and then we, we went round and round about, you know, what is an A student? You know, this child practice, you know, is it progress or is it performance? You know, you have one child that made great progress, but still doesn't play well. Do you give them an A or a C because they don't play well? And probably after about two years of this, we we did a lot of us just stopped filling in that thing and then finally we abandoned that grade thing and then it was much better parents just actually started they had to look at the criteria instead of oh you got an a in band that's great you know but the, you know so i get that excellent and then, and then looking at these four i mean it's what we do you know the dilemma is we have a new piece and 
how how do we practice this piece what are the hard parts you know and then we may break it into small groups all the clarinets all the trumpets i mean because you know and then we teach it that way and kids will sometimes help each other oh i think about it this way and i plan it whatever and then the community of practices that small group and then when we put everybody together uh you know, for, a, for a right. practice so i totally get this i, I mean uh -huh. this is, we're doing this in the susquehanna symphony right now with an incredibly hard piece of music uh, it, and, and it, it's very interesting because uh like i said oh Oh, here's another thing that just it just made me think about. My very first developmental interview was a musician. <laughs> and uh, it was the musicians that made the best muse, uh, use of this. Um, now, eventually, the, the rabbis at Hebrew Union did uh, did pretty well. Um, they, they actually um, got past the grades. One of the things that they, in the music program, though, they did have three or four years where everybody was kind of distorting the definitions to fit the top and the bottom of their class. And the way that the director got around that was uh, he made them all sit together and took videos of the students in each class, and they had to rate the whole spectrum. Uh, of skill, and once they did that, they they started to actually have better developmental ratings of each of the students, and that's when we we got to see that the uh, kids at the bottom of the class would uh, stick to the program. Um, so yes, musicians uh, musicians get it, and I think it's because the practice is so overt uh, in music and. Maybe it's because the mistake, mistakes are so obvious. <laughs> so, hey, David. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can see us. We have our hand up. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I didn't see the hand up, but I did see a, as soon as you said something, then uh, um, your video po popped up. So I can see you in the corner now. So sorry okay. I missed your hand. That's okay. So, um, very similar to Brian's information. When you're in, when teachers teach kids how to write, I mean, you can see how that's very similar to drawing over time that gets developed, but to help kids learn to write, there are these stages and we give them checklists to, to work on, you know, the first step basically is brainstorming, you know, and that's not even writing anything. That's just maybe uh, you have a notebook and you just brainstorm topics that you're interested in or that you know about or this or that or you're interested in, that kind of thing. And then then you have a pre-write where you just kind of write a few things about whatever topic you want to write about. And then you start to talk to some other people about it and maybe add some more looks. more. So there's this whole thing of developing and you give them the list. And when you when you talk to, again, parents, or even when you're conferencing with the student to find out, you know, well, where do you think you are in writing? You are a writer already because you've even thought about writing and you have some ideas and you you brainstormed a little bit and you, you put some thoughts down and, you know, then the next step is developing that more. And the whole time you're, like you said, you're collaborating and looking for new ideas and, you know, I can't imagine I have never written a book, <laughs> but I've written a lot of papers and, you know, it's, it's very hard, even writing an email, you know, you have an idea, you want to put, write something down and you, you put it down and you reread it and you, is that how I want it to sound and blah, blah, blah. So you, it's the very similar, you, know, you have to go through steps most times to, um, you know, to develop it the way that you want it to be perceived. Right. Get your ideas. Right. Yes, writing is a wonderful example, and if you've done a, a a wonderful job of describing the writing process. It was the second um, activity that we created developmental rubrics for, and we did this in the campus school in Plattsburgh, New York, way back in in the seventies. And we, I don't know if you've ever heard of Jim Moffat's teaching the universe of discourse. It was written in the late. 60s and he made 10 
uh, 10 different dimensions of, de of the development of writing skills. And what we did is we turned them, he just gave the two ends of the dimension and we turned them into discrete transformations so that we had uh, three or four uh, modes of practice within each one of the dimensions. And um, Jim became a friend of mine as a result of that uh, research. Uh, and I got appointed to the National Advisory Panel for Measurements and Standards in Writing. <clears throat> and uh, they, that in New York State, and they used our um, rubrics to train the raters for uh, the Regents Writing Competency Test, a high school writing competency test. But unfortunately, they had to make it a pass-fail test. And uh, mm -hmm. so all the beautiful kind of detail that, that uh, picks up the transformations in audience and time frame and perspective and beginnings and endings and word choice and uh, sentence structure and so forth, all the interesting transformations that take place along those dimensions got lost yeah. the, the raiders raided them but nobody ever saw them besides the raiders <laughs> wow. but uh any rate i that really developmental rubrics are became used in in uh writing education worldwide uh as a result and that was a great example thank you let's see all right, here's a, here's another slide for the, the the modes of commitment. This is transformative learning. You see the disorientation where you detect, then you examine it by reflecting, assessing your role, sharing it with others and distinguishing. Finally, you enabled yourself to do it by planning, rehearsing, and repowering, and then you perform it. And you know, that was that was what Brian was describing, and uh also Pat too. Nice. So you want to try using modes of practice and types of learning to interpret by a cal selection. Sure, what's the assignment? <laughs> okay, if you look there, okay, your assignment is, all right, whenever I do a preview, the first paragraph, it's always 200 words. I limit myself to 200 words. If I'm 201, I find a word to delete, okay? So I limit myself to 200 words. The first paragraph is always a summary. And the second paragraph uses uh, a concept from modes of practice or for the, from praxomics, a praxomics concept. It also uses a concept from the rabbis. So, we still have to talk about the concepts from the rabbis, but is there a mode of practice idea here uh, that you think would be useful for interpreting this? Can you flash up the modes? Okay. Sorry. The mode slide again. <coughs> no. um, this one? We should have printed it out. Modes of practice. We could see the modes of practice into the text from via Kale at the same time. I think that would be very helpful for us. Hmm. Um, yeah, that would have been a good idea. I didn't do that. <laughs> um, the only way you can get that would be if you pulled up your PDF that I sent out. Yeah. And looked at it there. Okay. Uh, but you know what I could do here? Whoops. I just violated my own method for doing this i'm gonna write them um... 
You're going to use the notes area. <laughs> Iterative learning. So David, maybe, I don't know if this is a good time or not. If you saw in the chat, um, Shelby put out a question. Um, do you think it's appropriate to maybe answer that now and then we go into the discussion? Okay, hold on just a second. Enable and perform. Here, does this help? Um, let me share my screen again. There we go. How's that? Does that help? Yeah, I think that's good, David. Okay, now let me look at... Uh, the chat. Oh, did I... Did I you go back to... Go back to the um, slide. Yeah. Show. Okay. Are you seeing the slideshow now? Wait a minute there. Yeah, it's no, a lot uh, smaller though. Okay. From current slide. Okay, here we go. Oh, now no. I can look at the chat. Ah, now I'm still uh, learning Zoom. So uh, let's see. What is the exact meaning? Oh, I didn't show you that did i okay <laughs> i missed that very good uh, shelby thank uh, you Dr. Dr. David, before, before you take that on uh, uh -huh. if, if just for continuity of what your what your exercise is here uh may i share a thought about that related to the task you've uh, given us uh i can't help but think of something which i guess i uh, in the realm of uh, educational psychology, cognitive psychology, specifically in um, study skills. Uh, one of those uh, technologies are uh, what I call highlights or standout effects, uh, making something prominent. Uh, typical student study skills, whether they be underlying or highlighting uh, with their yellow highlighter. Uh, and I, as I read this, uh, to uh, endow uh, the Israelites with uh, a divine uh, spirit of skill, ability, and knowledge. And in learning, uh, I think there was something uh, you said uh, about uh, strategies in learning theory, uh, which, uh, you know, using gold, silver, and cop copper and decorating uh, uh, the covenant to the tabernacle, tabernacle, so it has highlight and standout effect, uh, is to serve our abilities to uh, recall it, uh, to uh, deepen our understanding of it uh, as a continual process of self-reflection and, and uh, motivation to uh, acquire uh, the wisdom in terms of skill, ability, and knowledge to make the judgment. Uh, I, I've said a lot there, so feel free to pick any of that apart. Um, well, okay, let me go back and answer your first question. Uh, and that is, what is, a, what is a wisdom? And if we go, go here, all right, this, um, no, I, this one, I, I this certainly one. don't. I certainly don't mean to confuse the issue or derail you from your. Uh, no, 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 no. That's that's fine, and I'll, I'll answer both parts of it. Um, but um, your uh, your your question about what a wisdom is, um, I didn't answer that, and I should have. Um, so you see here, we have four different levels of shape control, and I did say that any level in one dimension can go with any level in any other dimension. So it's possible to have uh, scribbles 
under shape control and eye movement control. And if you wonder about that, just take a look at uh, a Kandinsky or a Moreau. <laughs> Sometimes they have haphazard uh, shape control and they'll have um, really good capability of controlling your eye movements in the painting kind of thing. So any level of one dimension can go with any level of other. So how many patterns do we have? Well, we have four of shape control and four of viewer distance. So that gives us 16 different patterns. Now we add in the dimensions. Any level, any one of those 16 patterns can go with any one of the four dimensions. So now we have 64 patterns, okay? Each pattern is a wisdom. The interesting thing is what happens when you start adding more dimensions. If you have 12 dimensions, you have uh, 10 million different patterns. If you have 20 dimensions, there's a trillion patterns, okay? Or a trillion wisdoms. The, the wisdom is just a, a different way of doing something. Uh, what, uh, uh, just to make sure I have uh, understood what you said correctly, uh, do you mean to suggest that uh, by wisdom you're referring to attributes? Well, I'm, I'm referring to the pattern of modes of practice that, that uh, a person uses in a particular situation. And so it's a little different. Well, I don't know. Um, I haven't actually gone through and uh, coded uh, Ecclesiastes or Proverbs. My son loves both Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. And so we talk about it quite a bit. Uh, and it might be an interesting thing to do, but I think that there are multiple dimensions in there. And um, they talk about a wisdom for this and a wisdom for that. And so I think that it doesn't distort the meaning of, uh, there are at least two meanings of wisdom. One is a person has wisdom and that's an older person. And when you talk to them, you will get wisdoms. And then there are the wisdoms uh, of the situation at the moment. And, and I think the, w the way that I'm using changing wisdoms, especially in the plural, tells you that uh, we're talking about situational wisdoms. Does that help? Uh, my, my mind just blanked out. I had a thought on that as you were speaking, but I was, uh, it was more important for me to listen to what you were saying than to cogitate. Uh, uh, when that thought comes back, when I recover it, I will uh, I will put it in the chat. Okay. Uh, All right. Uh, uh, now the I did recover it. Uh, given what you just said, and I'm a little bit vague on it, but uh, if these are the uh, you use them in plural wisdom, uh, how then uh, do you modify that as these things are changeable? And what, what do you mean by that? Okay, so when uh, when you come into a, a dilemma that causes you to think, oh, this mode of practice is a little primitive, um, <laughs> maybe I better get a new <laughs> one, okay? That is the uh, when you have a change in the wisdoms. So as soon as you're changing the patterns, kind of like a kaleidoscope, as soon as you twist the kaleidoscope just enough so that you have one bead falling in a different place, then you have a, a, a whole new pattern that you're, uh, that you're seeing. So, so the changing you wisdoms is, is um, the different patterns that you use. And it, uh, also the idea of changing wisdoms tends to underscore the fact that a primitive uh, choice is not necessarily a bad choice. We often say that it's good to start new things. Well, you're going to be a beginner when you start something new. So that's that you don't want to say beginning is bad. Um, not only not only that, we talk about keep it simple, stupid, right? That's a a a, a good advice uh, for somebody trying to get, to give a business talk, for example, uh, and um, uh, the exploratory. Practices are always simpler than the innovative or discovery practices. So it, the, by calling them changing wisdoms, it tends to underscore the fact that each mode of practice, no matter whether it's the most primitive 
part of the most advanced has has a place in our experience in our repertory of behavior uh can i try to furnish an example to see if i have uh what you're saying correct something sure. from melissa's brush uh in the golden calf uh melissa queried ever so softly ever so movingly uh, uh and gingerly uh could this have been avoided uh which uh even in our own country uh we fought a civil war and the supposition there seems to be uh if i can use your vernacular changing wisdoms uh that uh the forces and tensions that operated on the ancients uh it would be hubristic of us to suggest that those very same forces and tensions are not alive and well today uh would, would that be something I, I got everything except for the last sentence. I couldn't hear that well. Could you say it again? Uh, uh, of the forces and tensions that operated on the ancients and how uh, they approached oppositional uh, stance, as Moses said, those who are with God uh, uh, join, uh, stand with me, and those who not oppose. And then, of course, we had the apostasy and the, re the loss of life and the thousands as a result. Uh, we still today fight wars we have. We fought a bloody war and a civil war in this country and around the world we still do. Uh, and uh, the idea is that in the, if I'm using your, if I have a, a, a good understanding of your concept of changing wisdom, the thought there would be uh, that I think Melissa was trying to tease out is that it's somewhat huber, uh, hubristic and arrogant of us to suggest that the forces are not alive and well today, those forces which uh, operated on the ancients in their day and time. And the fault then is to have a certain hypocrisy uh, that, that, and an arrogance uh, that those forces aren't uh, still very well alive and in play uh, today. I don't, I, again, that's a lot I just said there. Um, I don't know if I got all that, uh, if I understood myself even correctly on that. I did have a, a number of ideas that, that uh, while you were talking, and I think that, that they're appropriate. You certainly can go into uh, the uh, Torah and identify uh, issues and problems that are still very much alive and dilemmas that are still very much alive. And also the, uh, the solution of, of the golden calf as a, as a solution to um, what you're going to have to bind yourself together as, as a people, uh, it being a more primitive solution. So that would be more of a, an exploring solution. And we certainly can have to say that, uh, uh having one god has been both sustaining and inspiring uh because it's lasted for at least two and a half thousand years right so but what's that yeah. saying united we stand divided we fall are the unifying force of monotheism and of bringing people together rather than uh deciding them and, and dividing them right um also, um, it's really interesting. One of the dimensions that we're going to come up with with, with the rabbinics is the context. And when you change the context, and you kind of alluded to context here, so I'm getting ahead of myself because I haven't given that dimension yet, <clears throat> but that's all right. When you change the context, you really... Uh, it has a huge impact on your understanding of what's being said. Uh, so some people just lift out of the Torah uh, and say that exactly the same words apply today. Other people will talk about the, how the context is, has changed uh, from the initial 
from the description of, of the time that was supposed to be to the time that was written to the time that was commented on to the to historical development of it and it, it that those are very different ways to, to approach it so we're going to talk about choosing dimensions uh later and i think your ideas are 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 very very interesting um and so let's move on to talk about exactly that mm, i seem to be stuck there we go okay so the part two is the dimensions from the reform rabbis and we're going to look at convert just one dimension now remember we had these three different dimensions of drawings we're going to end up after session two we're going to end up with 13 dimensions but for now we're only going to talk about one uh dimension and then we're going to talk about three others so i'm going to end today's talk with only four of the rabbi's dimensions so take take a look here and i think you'll see that um Some of the things that Shelby was talking about are easier to talk about in the context of interpreting text than it is in the more abstract uh, context of modes of practice. Now we have a dimension of modes of practice that relates to the, our problem of how do we interpret that particular text. So read the four different levels there so shelby when you were talking about a hypocritical approach to interpretation what ideas on interpreting the text are you comparing? Uh, 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 as I said, I was sort of, that was sort of a stream of consciousness in my thought. I don't even know if I understood myself correctly. Yeah, but think, just go back and think about it as what you said. Okay. Somebody who um, has. who just tries to take the Torah at face value and applies it today without thinking of any of the possible differences from that time or any of the possible similarities to that time. So I think you were- A point of clarification is needed, David, if I may. I put it in the chat. Uh, I'm still trying to capture the terminology you're using and I was wondering if it would be apt to describe what you're saying is changing as heuristic. Uh, I, 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 I don't mean to deflect from uh, where <laughs> you're going here. So I just mentioned that because I'm okay. still trying to polish off, uh, make sure I have a good understanding. but. Again, please don't let me derail uh, your exercise. Well, a, a, a heuristic is is more of a um, tool for simplifying, whereas um, modes of practice uh, is a tool for capturing the uh, complexity. Heuristic is usually done by itself in isolation from other things. I'm giving you an isolated dimension, but it, part of this dimension is the relationship between the different modes of practice within it. And then in order to get to a wisdom, you have to have multiple dimensions. So I think that the idea of heuristic is oversimplifies modes of practice. But let's go back to your other idea. How about, how about if I can generalize and just say strategy? Would that help or, or is that- Strategy is much closer, much closer. Okay, okay. thank you. <clears throat> um, so David, so, when, I yeah. was, when you had asked the original question, like, what are you using? Um, 
which strategies and, and what dimensions and so on. I immediately went to, well, beginning, because we're looking at this text and just like I would read Torah for, or, or, or have Torah read to me at the service, first, you know, I'm going for the, this is exactly the, the rabbi dimension here for interpreting the text is what, what I think many of us do is we're sitting in the sanctuary, we're listening in this case, or maybe reading along in the book uh, for what is it actually saying face value, like it says here, exactly. And then you start thinking about, well, not so much exploring, well, sort of exploring, but what does it really mean? And, and is there anything in the text, first of all, that is hard to even, you know, comprehend or put into place? And this particular one that you have, what was hard for me to put into place was, well, what happened before this? Now, luckily, we can go back to the previous, you know, chapter or paragraphs or, what, or verses and, and find out what happened before. But and other literal pieces that we're learning, we're starting on off in a book. You don't know what happened prior to this. You have to imagine or take clues and try to interpret it yourself. Like, well, this must have happened. And maybe this is why this, you know, why are the Israelites leaving Moses? Um, why were they there to begin with? I mean, so you have to kind of like figure out what's going on before you even start to um begin to understand the text and that's the exploring part of it and once you've explored and got through the actual literal little words and make sure you understand everything that's read first of all and then you know where's the time and place of this and 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 any other input that folks want to put into it then then you're ready to say what does it mean how what's important here for for us to know and is it for all of us, or is it just certain folks, or what am I, what's, how's it important to me, or how is it important to me as a person in the world, or as a grandmother, or, you know, whatever my different roles are, and then it becomes inspiring, because then you can say, oh, that's a good point, and now maybe I can really think of this situation in my life as a grandmother, or as a mother, or as a congregant, or sisterhood president, that it will inspire me to expand and change and share what I've learned here and even refer back and give reference to this particular piece and say, hey, here's what Moses and the Israelites did. <laughs> you know? So to me, that's what I'm gleaning, what you're looking for, maybe not, but. I, I think that was very interesting. And what you did was you just illustrated one of the things that I said about scale, okay? Mm -hmm. This whole process can happen in a day. Uh, you know, if you're if you're you're a good studier, I mean, it takes me generally a, a day to write my previews, and I do exactly that. I, first of all, I've got to learn it. I learn Hebrew and English before I write a preview, <clears throat> and then um, I look at it to see what jumps out. Usually, mm -hmm. something that fits or doesn't fit my perspective, like you said, and then uh, I'm looking for okay, what's the most important ideas here. So when I chanted, I just felt that the ark was the most important durable idea in the creating of the tabernacle. And so I chanted the section on the on the ark, right? But <clears throat> then I'll start reading the experts and the uh, the women's commentary, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, <clears throat> Musar uh, Torah commentary is another one that I go to uh, very often, but I can tell you on the uh, when David Aaron made it clear uh, in his little book that the the Genesis was written after the exile, so after the Babylonians conquered Israel and the people and took the people out and enslaved them in Babylon. And the, the purpose of the Torahs, the, every time now I go back and look at a, at a section, I have a different understanding of it than I had before I read David Aaron's little book, because now I'm seeing, oh, this is a person that's, that's lost his home, he's lost his community, and he's really concerned about what am I going to do to keep the community and He's done a really inspiring thing in 
uh, in writing these stories down. And these stories have really kept his community alive for hundreds of generations after him. <laughs> the, the inspiring thing is innovation and discovery kind of thing. It's not just inspiring our actions, but it's actually uh, inspiring things that help everybody. And so your applications to sisterhood in, in synagogue and to your own life, I think are, are really important. I think uh, you, you, you've come up with some very interesting ideas related to this, and I think they fit nicely. So. Uh, Dr. David, I just added something I promised at the beginning when, uh, uh, when it was just uh, Steve and I and yourself, well, John. Uh, I don't want people who see this to get confused by it. Excuse me, you have something in the chat that you want us to see? Uh, but uh, failed to uh, put into the chat what I had promised earlier about uh, what I had penned this morning as a result was just motivated by the drush from Friday night. Uh, I just put that in now. I don't want uh, Stephen, you were logged in when I promised that. I don't want others here present to be confused by it. Oh. Okay. Um, uh, whether uh, it, its relevance was, uh, I, again, I suggested it would be up to you to judge. Okay. Um, that relates to something that we need to need to discuss before we before we finish, and we're getting fairly late. So, um, these are three more dimensions. I'm. They're all in the uh, PDF that I sent you before, and so I think you can read them yourselves. And you've also already offered some really nice. Uh, I, I ideas related to the messages that, that uh, I'd hoped you were going to get today. And so I think you can do this on your own. Um, this is a page that just tells you what are the main ideas that we've talked about. This is the one that you wanted to sit next to you when, when you were uh, doing your interpretation. And maybe also under the three other dimensions, you're going to want to have the levels as well. I didn't put them on that slide. Uh, probably should have if I had room. Um, here are some questions um, that I hoped we would have time to uh, address. Um, but maybe what we should do is we should start uh, start with those the next time that we get together. Um, now, the next question is, hmm, uh, there we go. How should we use it so we don't lose it? Remember when I said that the bias training wasn't working because it was one shot training, okay? So I made this, this slide uh, to help to address that. And um, one of the things that I also was thinking about was in our synagogue in uh, Raleigh, we had a Tanakh study that attracted 40 people every Monday morning. Um, and um, I was thinking that if we do this right, uh, we might be able to have a, a weekly kind of short meeting. And at the same time as, as I was thinking about that, Melissa uh, wrote me a note said she would be interested in doing a, a Torah study uh, on at lunchtime maybe a 45 minute session on Monday or Tuesday. So um, I put those two ideas together and I think that we could have a group that actually um, exchanges ideas. Um, and uh, I could, it'll, at the very least, 
do my Torah portion previews as a starter for uh, discussion in a week. But I think anybody that wanted to uh, pose a question to the group uh, would be most welcome to do that. And um, it's not the, in our Torah study or our Tanakh study in Raleigh, not everybody came every week. There were some people uh, like me and Rabbi Mike that came almost every week. Um, and there were other people that just dropped in and out when they wanted to. So I don't think that this has to be, you know, this is your commitment. You've got to do it every week you know, kind of thing. But it, uh, I think the more often that people do it, the more these ideas will become uh, part of your uh, part of your thinking. They'll stay with you. You'll be and you'll be excited about them tomorrow. If you don't talk about them again until June, uh, you probably will for, have forgotten most of this stuff. So, in fact, I think we could use these questions as good starters for our weekly discussion. So, I would like to ask if people are like this idea. Yeah, what I mean, obviously, I, obviously, I like the idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I full disclosure, I always have a lot of really great intentions. Um, you know, at the new year, at, at the whole high holidays, I always say, okay, I'm going to read the Torah portion every week this year. And of course, it's easy in the beginning, because the narratives are fun and interesting and things like that. And then as it as the year progresses, and my schedule gets busy, life just tends to get in, in the way. So actually reaching out to you, David, I thought maybe, um, you know, we could hold each other accountable, so to speak, like I would be more motivated to stick to it if, if uh, you know, you were committing time to meet with me. So, yeah. Well, and um, I'm committed to, to doing this. So I will do it every week, even on vacation. I'll do it. Melissa, See? you gave me a good example. You <laughs> you zoomed in from Israel, okay? So if you can if you can zoom in from Israel, I can zoom in from um, Ocean City. <laughs> okay, and, and I will do the same. Yes. I might not zoom from there though. I might have to do a telephone or something. I, I'll figure <laughs> out a way though. It depends on what kind of internet connection I get on there. Uh, uh, David, before you end, and I know you want to wrap up. Uh, I wanted to tease out something you queried me about uh, when I mentioned hypocrisy. Uh, if I could just say that what I've noticed is a trend, and it is a wider trend of uh, society, uh, not just within our community, what I refer to as knocking, uh, knock the knock. Uh, and so when I mentioned that word or of an arrogance or hubris uh, of those who would speak out today against uh, refer to it as an Old Testament, as a relic of the past, uh, of not having relevancy or not having right. a, uh, to learn from, to develop and own one's insight into the events of today. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, good. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I call those people fundamental, fundamental atheists. Okay, so they're they're fundamentalists, but they're on the atheistic side. They they have no imagination. <laughs> they they can't conceive uh, of of what uh, God might be in, in a meaningful context of our modern uh, thinking and capabilities. So. Um, that, that, that is a primitive, simple way to address the, the wonderful stories in the Bible uh, and the inspiring stories in the Bible. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that, that it's, it's not a real healthy thing, but overuse of exploratory strategies, and that's definitely one because it's a very simple strategy, and overuse of it uh, can lead to negative things. And just to buttress that, the, the Ten Commandments, uh, you know, the, these are written, uh, written, uh, they are statutory, they're formed in statute, uh, 
uh, we uh, in uh, at the foot of Sinai stand in all of the law to observe uh, the power of the written word to create civil society. Uh, that is a process uh, that is something you make progress. It's not progress to make perfect, but um, you know what a myth that would be. But something to progress on. Right. So, um, what are some other people's reactions to the idea of the facilitating group? I like it. Uh, have you had any conversation with uh, Rabbi Mika about it, just out of curiosity? Um, no, because when I came up with it, <laughs> she was in Israel and not feeling well. So yeah. I, maybe when she gets home, uh, I will let her know that um, mm -hmm. we're doing this. And mm -hmm. um, it, it, I also thought <clears throat> it should be the core is going to be these changing wisdoms, the two things that we're talking about. One is the praxomic stuff. <clears throat> the other is the rabbinical rubrics. Um, so those kind of things, you all have a, a, a level of knowledge that you uh, about both of these things that you didn't have before we started today. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. So, <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, it's those things that we're going to use. So it's those things that will kind of bind us together. So if anybody else that you know of is kind of interested in our group, wants to know what we're doing, I'd be glad to give this presentation again uh, to uh, them individually or in a small group uh, uh, again. But so um, let's see. Denise, do you want to be included? I didn't. Um. Or is it, yeah, I would be interested as long as, okay. you know, I can miss once in a while, depending upon Absolutely. what the schedule that, is. The, 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 sure, the, I, I wouldn't mind at all. Okay, and how about you, Steve? Yes, so. Okay, all right, so that's everybody that's here today. So I have everybody's emails, and Pat? <laughs> so um, I just wanted to share that if there's, you know, you're getting a, a small group of people that are available, like either during a lunchtime or during the day, during the week. I know that with our previous rabbi, we had, you know, Torah studies on Saturday on Shabbat. And, um, you know, we had pretty much this group and a few other folks that would, would join in uh, because that's when they're available and they're usually relaxed and uh, not those with children, but, you know, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, sometimes sometimes Jessica would come on or Susanna or Brian, but um, you, know, you may want to think about that if you're trying to grow the group at all, or you may have to have two separate sessions. Um, I know that with me, actually kind of busy, if you do it, you know, while the baby's napping, that's great. I'm there 100%. <laughs> I'm not there. So, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's understandable. It's and the time really came from Melissa. She said <clears throat> that's when she was going to be available. And yeah. well, and that, that's fine. right. Yeah, I'm flexible. Shabbat, Shabbat's fine too. So, right. okay, so what other can, ideas do people have about when to do it? Because that, you know, being retired, I can yeah, do it almost any time. <laughs> so you mentioned David. On, on what's on the screen here, Monday, March 13th at noon. Now, I'm not <laughs> available tomorrow at noon, uh -huh. but Tuesdays are usually good, and Tuesday mornings are usually good for me. So Yeah, I, I meant to have Tuesdays as a general rule, but I couldn't do it this Tuesday because we're already having a medical appointment. So right. I didn't want to delay it for a long time, but you know, some of it can be done on, on email too, right? And we, we don't have to be stuck to just uh, a yeah. Zoom conversation, but. I guess for me, I, I work from home. So I spend um, all day on my laptop. Uh, so it's cringe worthy for me to join, uh, it, to, to open up my laptop at night or, on the weekends, just because it, it just feels like it just feels like work. 
Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and we're supposed to have fun. Remember, I told you it was fun, functional, and fascinating, right? So right. <laughs> maybe we can have a fun computer and laptop interlude for the day. <laughs> okay. Um, well, okay, Pat, uh, I think that um, let's go ahead and do it. We'll, I'll send you stuff out, uh, Steve, and um, I'm not sure, I guess we'll tape all of these things so you could look at it afterwards if you wanted to do it. And we'll meet for 45 minutes and that'll be just like, uh, you know, an old professor, it's hard hard to get a habit out of it um, because um, my classes used to be 50 minutes. So I might run over five minutes, but <laughs> I will try to keep it as close to 45 minutes as I can and not having people walk out of the room before I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so what time will you be starting these, David? At 12, tomorrow, 12 30? tomorrow noon. Tomorrow at noon, okay. Or, or is that, I'll say that, Melissa, now you did say noon, but could we make it a, like a quarter afternoon? Yeah, that's fine. 12, 15. So let's make it 12, 15. And that mm -hmm. way I can pick up Annette from her knitting session. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's fine. Are you, yeah. talking about, are you talking about just Monday at 12, 15? And then the yeah, tomorrow at 12, 15. At and then the following weeks, it'll be Tuesdays at 12, 15. Oh, 1215. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Unless that makes a problem for people, but I think 1215 to one o'clock, that, that tells us, okay, we're going to be done at one o'clock no matter what. But we'll always have next week to do it. And, and so I will try to keep track of our progress and where we are and say, okay, this is this is how we get started next week. Okay. So so David, do we need to set up a Zoom session? Um and and make that a recurring make make one for tomorrow and then make it recurring on Tuesdays. Would you like that? Um, we 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 couldn't just use this link. We could. Could we? Why don't we just use yeah. this link? Keep it simple. Okay. And uh, um, I think it's set up so that anybody can start it. So if you get there ahead of time, you can go ahead and start. It. Right. So t tomorrow, it, it just I can't. Um, yeah. I'm already scheduled for another meeting. Um, uh -huh. I won't be able to make it tomorrow. But right. uh, Tuesdays thereafter, I should be okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Tuesdays for me probably work better too, just because um, I'd like to read the tour portion in advance of the session, and uh -huh. Monday's kind of early in the week. Okay. That's all. So, um, all right. so, yeah, I have to read tomorrow's portion today, which I so will. Which tomorrow, I will. tomorrow, let's do that. The second to the last slide, our third to the last slide. What is happening? How is your understanding changes? That's what we'll focus on tomorrow. I think that that's really important to do. And then we'll start. Do, then from that point on, I'll I'll start sending out uh the torah portions but i don't I'm not sure sure whether i should send out torah portions before you guys or if i should wait for your interpretations first but we'll see how it works because right, i good. i have <laughs> written them every week and and you know i can do this because i've done it every week from july i haven't missed one yet so i will so, so i just want to mention just logistics here on march 21st so that's the following you know not nick not this Tuesday for the following Tuesday, there's a lunch and learn at 12. Mm, uh oh. Right. That's right. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so let's just skip that week then. Who okay. leads lunch and learn? Brian. Brian? Okay. Yeah. Is that March 21st? Yes. I thought it was. <laughs> I thought we changed it to March 28th, didn't we? 28th is uh, in the evening. Diana. Diana. Right. Oh, evening, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's not a lunch to learn on the twenty first. Oh, okay. oh, there's not. No, my no we just there. had we just had a lunch and learn, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, with Kevin Brass. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it wouldn't be it wouldn't be coming up again a month later. No, there's nothing on 
the temple that, calendar. That but, moved. That this is the Kevin Bress one. Okay, never mind. Okay, so we'll, we're Christmas. back on. We'll do the twenty first. Everything it's going to be every Tuesday afterwards, unless you guys let me know that there's something going on that we can't we can't do. And uh, so, yeah, actually, uh, um, uh, Steve, you were looking at February, I think. No, I was looking at March. Uh, it, it was before we changed it. Oh. The um, so I had it. It was a remnant and I never updated. Oh, on your personal calendar. Got it. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, I'm very excited about this, I'll tell you. And you guys are fantastic. This has been most fun for me. So, and I hope for you too. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, David. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you. That was great. David, this was excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Steve, are you gonna you can hit stop recording? I can hit stop recording. Perfect.